uh, European leaders uh, would be upset, obviously, with President Trump if he goes through on this, but that would be the latest of many insults to hear the Federalist Bree Payton uh, say. Uh, Bree, you know, it's interesting. Um, at the Federalist, I'm sure you write on this, is that this view that the president almost relishes getting in their face, uh, maybe because so many were snickering at him. But uh, update me on that relationship post uh, his first foreign trip and meeting a lot of them. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of this anticipated reaction that European leaders are going to be upset uh, if Donald Trump agrees to tear up the Paris Agreement, I honestly think he should ignore it because, listen, a lot of these European leaders are acting like the girl who won't pick up the check. I think that he needs to uh, just ignore it and focus on what's best for American manufacturers. All throughout his campaign, he made himself the champion of manufacturing companies like my dad, who owns a small manufacturing company mm. uh, in Covina, California. And I think he should really continue that rhetoric because ultimately this Paris climate agreement is not fair towards American manufacturers. It requires our country to pay out billions of dollars in climate reparations uh, to third world dictators who are among the worst polluters on the planet. So ultimately I think he should continue being the champion of American manufacturers uh, and look at this agreement and say this is unfair and puts an unfair burden on our small businesses um, and tear it up. You know, uh, he said during the campaign, Brie, that he thinks the climate change thing is a hoax perpetrated by China. He dialed the China thing back, but he never did the hoax thing. Um, that was not received well in Europe. Uh, but if he goes through with this and nixes our part and our participation in this, then the main means by which it's paid for, uh, which would be the United States uh, starting to make good on it, like immediately, uh, well, countries like China and India could delay acting on things a decade out. Then what happens to it? Yeah. Well, I think ultimately the problem with a lot of the rhetoric uh, and a lot of the terms of this agreement, um, the Paris Climate Agreement, you know, are based on claims that aren't so scientific, right? The way that uh, our, the way that the temperature increases have been measured isn't very scientific the way that they've been doing that. So, you know, I do think it's fair to question the processes um, and how we've been measuring this. I think that that's completely fair. And I think you're right in that it does place a totally unfair burden. You know, U.S. would have to pay out billions of dollars in reparations. Meanwhile, China, which is among one of the worst polluters on the entire planet, you know, the only terms that they would have to adhere to in this agreement would be to maybe think about stopping uh, increasing their carbon emissions sometime around 2030, right? I think it's very clear um, that this deal was placing the brunt of the burden on our country. And I think that, you know, this is a global problem and we need to be thinking yeah. about global solutions and not just flogging the United States. One of the arguments for doing something about it is that this was the consensus of the scientific community. Of course, some 30, 40 years ago was the consensus of that same community that we had a global freeze to look forward to. <laughs> On the cover of Time magazine and Newsweek and Businessweek, they would, they would show polar bears, you know, uh, you know across like a snow-covered uh, New York City or what have you. But, but, but it got to the point where that was the consensus, that that's what we had to look forward to, a frozen tundra, Antarctica-like world. Of course, it didn't pan out. Now, people forget that, but I still have those magazines. So uh, whether Donald Trump goes that way or not, uh, how do you think he should present this pull-up? Yeah, I don't think he needs to necessarily go that way because I think that we should all be good stewards of our planet. I mean, as someone who grew up in California, my parents can tell you that they really couldn't go outside in the 70s during some times of the year True. because the air was so bad, right? So I think it makes sense to put forward smart solutions uh, that keep everything cleaner for everyone. But yeah, I think no it's one very is pro clear. dirty air. No one yeah. is <laughs> pro, you know, like making the world poisonous for our kids. But. Yeah, you're exactly right. So I think it is very clear uh, that it makes sense to be smart and keep the air clean, um, you know, and maybe look at uh, the way that if the temperature has been increasing in an alarming way, okay, that's fine. We can talk about it. We can right. talk about ways of uh, changing our activity in order to reduce that. But I think, you know, flogging the United States, meanwhile, letting the world's worst polluters just do whatever they want. I mean, it's clear that that's where the problem is. And I think it's clear that the solution needs to come from there. And I think it makes sense. Um, to say, you know, going forward, let's put something better together that actually is going to reduce the carbon emissions that are being put out because very clearly, right. you know, ignoring China, which is one of the world's worst polluters, doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, they do get a pass on this, uh, a commitment to spend money. They always money get a, a pass on everything, right? It's not fair, <laughs> Bree, it's not fair. All right, Bree Payton, the Federalist staff writer. Good seeing you again. Good seeing you.